morning. I'm Doug Preston, director of the Oneida Historical Society, and today I'm visiting the historic Utica State Hospital. Not only is the old main building of the State Hospital an outstanding example of 19th century Greek Revival architecture, but the institution itself is historically significant as the first facility for the care of the mentally ill in the state of New York. Over the years, the various directors and staff of Utica State Hospital have employed many and varied methods in the treatment of their patients. The first director, Dr. Amariah Brigham, was one of the first medical men to recognize mental illness as a disease, and he pioneered many methods of treatment. Here at the hospital is a remarkable archive and collection of relics and books and pictures that tell much about not only Utica State Hospital, but over the years, the changing ideas and methods of treatment of mental illness. Mr. Lyle Engel, a volunteer at Utica State, has located, sorted, cleaned, and repaired a large collection of early record books, pictures, and relics of the hospital. And today, we will take a look at some of these, along with Mrs. Engel and some of the other hospital staff members. This is Lieutenant's office, Doug. Okay. Uh, you'll notice over in here, the fireplace, and if you look closely, you can see that each of the uh, directors in the history of the hospital has had their name inscribed. If you come a little bit closer, you'll note that Dr. Brigham was the first superintendent uh, from the period of 1842 to 1849, succeeded by Dr. Benedict from 1849 to 1854, and he was succeeded by Dr. Gray, who was superintendent for 32 years from 54 to 1886. It's primarily during this period of time that we will be discussing the artifacts this morning. Mm -hmm. okay. And this is Dr. Gray over here, I believe. This is Dr. Gray. Sort of an interesting history associated with Dr. Gray. Uh, Dr. Gray, at that period of time, was considered an expert witness. He was called to testify in many trials when it was suspected that the individual on trial perhaps had a uh, mental problem. He had testified in the trial of Charles Guiteau, who was the assassin of President Garfield. There was an individual living in Utica at the time by the name of Henry Remshaw, who had no personal grudge against Dr. Gray, but was concerned about his testimony at the trial of this uh, Charles Guiteau. Henry Bemshaw came to the office of Dr. Gray one day in March of 1882 and using a large Navy revolver tried to assassinate Dr. Gray. Fortunately for Dr. Gray, he turned his head just in time so that while he was injured, the injuries were not fatal. Dr. Gray continued on as superintendent for four years beyond this point. Uh, he died in 1886 of Bright's disease of kidney ailment. No people have said that he was assassinated by this Ramshaw. That was not true. It was not true. His health suffered after the assassination attempt, but he did not die of the gunshot wound itself. Oh. I see we have here uh, some of the early case books and some medical library in this angle. Um, I wonder if you could tell me what, now what is this particular? This is the first case book. Now, today when a patient is admitted to the uh, facility, each patient has an individual record. At that time, all patients' histories were recorded in a very large book. This happens to be the first case book, and this is a report of the first patient admitted to the facility. Now, I see this is a man from Steuben County. Now, Steuben in Oneida County right. and admitted the 14th of January, 1843. And his background was a farmer, though it says for a year or two has been a clerk in a store has been deranged about 15 months. Supposed cause, now this is something, a severe cold, which almost made him crazy, and then the death of a brother, this last, affected him very much and probably caused his insanity. Then his course of stay in the hospital is reported. Uh, you will note at the bottom of the page that he was uh, ultimately discharged in February, condition improved. In the same year? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what, uh, what well, these are some books that, uh, this one in particular, was uh, saved from the fire in 1857. Mm. You As you can see, the, it's uh, charred on the outside. So. Right. And this is from the medical library of what was then called the New York State Lunatic Asylum. And you'll notice the publication date? 1657. This right. is called The Immortality of the Human Soul. 
Mm -hmm. And these are other valuable boxes as well. Now, could we take a look at some of the other artifacts and relics of the hospital? Certainly. Let's go into the next room. The staff are waiting for okay. us there. Here, Doc, we're going to be showing you some of the items from our archive library that are related to the treatment of the mentally ill in the 1800s. I thought we might start with a discussion of the chronology yet. Okay. Perhaps you can give us a little bit of background, Doc, uh, on the, chronology? Yes. Phrenology was a a medical theory or physiological theory that was popular in the 19th century. It was based on the idea that you could uh, determine different aspects of a person's personality uh, by examining the bumps and contours on the, on the human skull. Uh, the theory being that different areas of the brain controlled uh, different parts of the personality and parts that were more or less developed would be reflected in the contours of the skull. And if I'm not mistaken, this, this hat uh, is meant to measure the, the shape of the skull. Uh, this all. is true. Mrs. Schaller, perhaps you could put the hat on Mr. Gershner's head. And we could talk a little bit about it. This diagnostic hat was imported from France in the 1800s. As the hat was placed on the head, the side pieces expanded according to the size and shape of the head. Movement of the side pieces resulted in movement of tiny, needle-like projections in the top of the hat. When the lid of the hat was closed, the needles punctured a piece of tissue paper, leaving a permanent record of the peculiarities of each head being examined. For obvious reasons, use of the phrenology hat never became widespread or accepted in medical circles. I might add that it was, though, for many years a very popular idea. Um, a gentleman named Orson Squire Fowler uh, was one of the people who spread the idea of phrenology in America. And while that idea did not become too successful, another of Fowler's ideas, which was the invention of the octagon house, the eight-sided house, uh, did become very popular. Interesting how these 19th century theorists uh, sought to improve life in many different ways. Well, prevention of fire had always been a major concern particularly since the fire of 1857. Lyle Engel has one of the early fire extinguishers in front of him. Maybe he could tell us a little bit about it. Well, this is called a fire hand grenade. And it was used in the 1870s. And uh, when thrown into the fire, the liquid, liquid chemicals inside was released, hoping to put off the fire. You know, in addition to this fire extinguisher, Doug, on each of the wards, the ward attendants were required to fill water buckets every night before they went to bed, just to ensure that there was an adequate supply of water on hand in the event of an emergency. Uh-huh. Now, what, uh, what else do we have here on, on the table? When we're talking about an era before the discovery of the antibiotics. Patients frequently suffered from respiratory infections. One of the means uh, that was available at the time to treat respiratory infections was the vaporizer. Ida Mears was going to tell us about this vaporizer. Yes, this vaporizer that was used for so many years at this hospital had to be uh, assembled before it could be used. Uh, on the bottom of this vaporizer is a container to put in 95% solution of alcohol. Then you had to make sure that you had a wick long enough to extend into the solution. And then on the top here was a container that you would put plain water or a solution of tincture of benzoin and water. And then you had to light the wick with this container of solution on top. And then as the water boiled, the steam mist would come out through this part here on the vaporizer. I have another interesting little item. I think we can be fortunate that we weren't working as nurses back in 1866. They had a problem with the uh, Shenango Canal from which the hospital got its major portion of the water supply. Uh, the lock was, had to be closed off and the water supply was cut off for a period of about 27 days. During that period of time, the water for use for bathing, doing the laundry, all had to be obtained from melting snow. If you can imagine melting snow to carry on your nursing duties, to be thankful that you're working today and not thankful. I'm glad I wasn't there. Now, what um, other changes or what other differences were there in the hospital in the days before electricity? 
Well, since you did mention the electricity, Doug, we might add that electricity wasn't uh, put into use in this building until 1888. Therefore, if we go down the table to Arlene Mason, she has with her one of the original water lanterns, and maybe she can tell us a little bit about it. The brass lantern was an essential part of the equipment because they were used at night to make rounds through the wards to check the patients. But like Barbara said, in 1888, electricity was installed and all gas lights and kerosene lanterns became obsolete at that time. You have a picture there, Arlene, that shows the uh, early nursing staff carrying the lanterns? Yes, we do. You can see the lanterns over here on the side and some of the nurses are holding the lanterns that were carried through the wards to check the patients. I'm sure they were very glad to do away with it, and they would be the fire hazard. I'm sure. June Scheller has in front of her a number of different types of feeding cups. Perhaps she could tell us about them. These cups were used for patients who were unable to hold a cup or a glass and thus feed themselves, and the nurse would hold it by the handle. This was one of the original styles in a ceramic, and of course the spout here was put into the patient's mouth so that you could gradually pour the liquids, and the patient could swallow them. Finally, a middle item here is in the glass, uh, and when I came in training here at Utica, we had these metal cups, the porcelain chipped off so that they weren't too practical. The present cup is a plastic material, and it does work well. Sitting next to you, Doug, is Betty Martin. She's one of our instructors from the Education and Training Unit, and we thought it would be appropriate if she talked to you about the lung motor. This is the lung motor used many years ago. Uh, some people refer to it today as the, or used to refer to it as the pull motor. Uh, if you take the face mask, which you can see Doug is made of metal, uh, it would supposed to fit over the face very tightly. But if the person that was trying to rescue the victim had any problems, they used this right here. You can see it. Uh, the jaw spreader. Can I? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say as I blame you. You're going to be willing and open your mouth. Right. And this, of course, was the uh, tongue forceps. And many times a person's tongue will fall back and uh, cover the airway, and they're not able to breathe. And so this was used to pull your tongue forward again. Okay. No? <laughs> OK, if you just put this over your face bag, I can show you. Uh, it was made very much like a, a bicycle pump. This was pulled up, and you could feel the air coming in. But you're supposed to hold it very tightly over your face, or be held very tightly over your face in order to get a tight seal. And if you don't, they also took a wet washcloth and put it in between to get that tight seal, and push down like this each time the air would go in. You can see the hoses that go into the mask, and this air comes through here into the person's so mouth or lungs. Yes? Did you tell me something about these shoes with the locks and zippers and so forth on them? Yeah, these are kind of interesting, Doug. Uh, first of all, they were made right here in the hospital. This hospital was extremely self-sufficient at that period in time. They made all the clothing, all of the furniture, just about everything that they needed, they made here. Practically all the food that they ate, they grew here. The canvas shoes are just one example of the types of shoes that were made here during the 1800s. You'll notice the zippered area in the back. These shoes were intended for patients who would not keep their shoes on during the day. The floors were sometimes very cold in the winter months. Rather than having the patients walk around barefooted or in their stocking feet, these shoes were put on the patient. The back was zipped up. The padlock was put in place. Once the padlock was put in place, the shoes cannot be removed because there is not adequate room at the top to slip the foot in and out of the shoe. Okay? This was not really any kind of a restraining device, only an attempt to keep the patient's feet warm. Okay? On the other hand, this shoe was a restraining device. This shoe was used in conjunction with this early restraint chair. You'll notice here on the restraint chair that there are very small flanges at the bottom. These flanges were attached to the floor. Therefore, the chair could not be moved and the patient could not shift his position back and forth. You will notice that the shoes are attached to the front of the chair. That's what these straps were for. Now, it may seem a little bit, you know, inhumane looking at it in this day and age, but I think what we can say, Doug, is that there were no tranquilizers back then. There was very little known about the causes of mental disorders. 
Uh, no one really knew quite what to do with a patient who was overactive and disturbed. This restraint chair was developed more or less to hold the patient in one place to prevent him from injuring himself and others. Okay? While we're talking about the restraint shoes, we might even mention the restraint gloves. Come on, Dick. We've been wanting to do this for a long time. I'm sure you have. <laughs> this restraint glove was put in place, locked. You'll note that here there's a little place for the key. Restraint glove was locked in place. That held the glove in place, prevented the patient from scratching his own body, removing dressings, injuring himself or other people. Okay? These gloves could be used while the patient was ambulatory, walking about the ward, did not restrain him in any, in any way other than to keep his fingers in closed. Uh -huh. okay? A device I've heard quite a bit about and read about is the so-called Utica crib. Now you have a picture of that. Could you tell me about that? Right. The Utica crib was actually first used in France. It became known as the Utica crib primarily because Dr. Brigham brought it to the Utica Asylum back in 1846. Now it looks like a very restraining device, Doug. Actually, we borrowed one here a couple of years ago, and we came to the conclusion that there was quite a bit of room in there for a patient to move around in. Borrowed it for exhibition purposes. Borrowed it for <laughs> exhibition purposes, true. You will note that there is an area here that can be locked. The patient was placed on a mat inside the crib. The upper part of the crib was locked. The patient, therefore, had free movement within the crib, but he could not get out of the crib. Uh, the crib is a lot more roomy than it appears to be. The person could move back and forth, could turn over, lie on his side, stomach, back, could not sit up, obviously, and could not get out of the crib until someone came and released him. This crib was used until about 1887 when the last crib was removed from the Utica uh, Psychiatric Center. There are very few of these cribs left. Uh, we had to borrow one from Hudson River some years back. Uh -huh. Now, in the speaking of restrained patients and so forth, what about um, criminally insane people? Were they ever you, uh, brought to Utica? You know, that's interesting, Doug. When this institution was first opened, the early superintendents envisioned this as a hospital for the acutely ill individual, someone that could respond to treatment, someone who would get better and would go home within a reasonable period of time. Because there were so many patients waiting to get into the hospital for treatment, they had to establish a procedure whereby if the person did not show adequate recovery within a two-year period, they were released from the hospital, whether the patient wanted to go or not was irrelevant. The patients who were here for two years without improvement were either sent back to their families or returned to the poor houses from which they came. In addition to this problem, it soon became apparent that there was no place in the state of New York to care for the criminally insane. They began sending patients here from the various prisons across the state. Because these people were most of the time very disturbed, they could not be taken care of on the wards with the other patients, and it was necessary to develop rooms in the basement area, in the attic area, and even in another portion of the hospital, totally away from the patient living areas. These patients were, for the most part, very noisy and very disturbed and required special treatment. Well, this has been very interesting to see um, these many things from the past history of the Utica State Hospital. But Barbara, I think, I think people would like to know is how is it that today that this hospital that was once so busy and such a pioneering institution and so forth, how is it that this great building is now empty and no longer being used? As early as 1844, Dr. Brigham had already noted that this building was not adequate to care for all of those patients who required treatment at the time. The hospital census was 276 patients. As the years passed, crowding became a distinct problem. By 1930, the situation had become critical. 2,548 patients were receiving treatment in the hospital. Following the development and use of tranquilizing medications, however, in the early 1950s, and with the subsequent discovery and use of other newer drugs, more sophisticated forms of treatment were developed, and the hospital census began a gradual decline. By the early 1970s, hospital treatment units were gradually being merged. The third floor of the main building was closed first. 
followed a few years later by closure of the second floor. By 1978, it was no longer feasible to maintain this building as a patient care area. Patients and staff were gradually removed to other units. And on Thursday, September 28, 1978, this main building was officially closed. Doug, before you leave, I'd like to ask you just one more question. You mentioned earlier that this old main building has been placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Exactly what does this mean? Barbara, the National Register of Historic Places is simply a list of buildings and sites which are considered worthy of preservation for their historical or architectural significance. It happens that this list is administered by the United States Department of the Interior. Now, the way that a building or place is listed on the register is that it begins often with local people, a county historian or local preservation society, who recommends a building for listing on the National Register. There's quite an involved application process where the history and uh, background and significance of the building must be documented. In New York State, it must pass a, a state board and then is referred on to the federal level at Washington, and only then is the building listed. So with this process, as you can imagine, not just any building uh, gets listed on the National Register. National Register listing certainly is an honor and, as I say, a recognition of great historical and architectural significance of a building. Unfortunately, however, it does not mean, as I think some people sometimes think, that a building being listed can never be demolished or altered or torn down. A National Register listing does uh, place uh, roadblocks, and <laughs> roadblock is a very good word, uh, in the way of demolition. In the case of, for instance, a federally funded highway project or a flood control project or something like this that might threaten a building. If, for instance, a highway were to be built with federal funds, as most are these days, um, and a building listed in the register was in the proposed path of the road, there would be quite an involved review process that would be involved to see if there was any possible way that this could be avoided or the building moved or somehow it be preserved uh, before the federal government would allow funding uh, of a project that would threaten such a building. The state of New York, in fact, at this time has legislation, state legislation pending to put more teeth in the federal uh, register uh, designation at the state level and to make it a state policy for buildings owned by the state on the National Register to be preserved, uh, to have preservation be a, an important consideration of state policy. At present, this is not really so, uh, though the New York State Division for Historic Preservation uh, has endorsed the preservation of this particular building. I think the great question now with the old main building at Utica State is, who is going to preserve it and how are they going to preserve it? Uh, the state uh, Department of Mental Hygiene is no longer using it and apparently does not feel that they will use it again in the future. And so the question is then, what use can it be put to? I think many would feel, and I think rightly so, that it is not sufficient to let it just stand and be a, an impressive ruin, though buildings similar to this from the days of ancient Greece are preserved just as that. We have not torn down the Parthenon. It isn't used for anything, really. It's just something that we go and look at as a, a relic of antiquity. And perhaps this building might come to that someday. It would be very costly to demolish it. So it could be just left standing as a, a monument to the 19th century. But I think what we would perhaps like better to see would be some new use, uh, some active use found for the building. Uh, perhaps some other state use, something in connection perhaps with the Upper Division College, though it's a question to throw in yet another alternative site on, on that whole question, or some other uh, state bureaucratic function, some state department perhaps could use this building, or perhaps it could be used for some commercial development for apartments or some other mixture of residential and commercial purposes. Uh, just up the street here is another old hospital building, the old St. Luke's Hospital. Um, not as large a building, it's true, but this has been redeveloped and um, preserved as, I say, a combination of office space and apartments and is presumably paying a good return to its owner, who has not preserved it for his health, uh, but to make money off of it and seems to be doing so. So this is 
Well, this is really where Utica State Hospital stands today, uh, at a, a question mark of what will become of it, how will it be preserved.